Welcome to the Harmony of Interest Book Talks, where we explore ideas that shape our world. My name is Evan Papp, and I'm the executive producer for Empathy Media Lab that publishes content on labor, political economy, art, and culture, and we are a proud member of the Labor Radio Podcast Network. Today, I'm speaking with labor and immigrant rights activist Victor Naro about his new book, The Activist Spirit, Toward a Radical Solidarity, published by Hardball Press. In this book, Victor explores the spiritual core within social justice activism, from which we can deepen our solidarity with each other. And he calls us to integrate that inner spiritual core into our work to make the struggle for justice more compassionate, caring, and sustainable. And how being an activist for justice is to love humanity and all of creation. Victor has been involved with immigrant rights and labor issues for over 35 years, and he is currently the project director for the UCLA Labor Center and core faculty for the UCLA Studies Program in the Public Interest Law. Victor, your biography is very long from being an author and writing many law reviews and journal articles, teacher and law professor, and you've led numerous organizations and campaigns, including the Multi-Ethnic Immigrant Workers Organizing Network, National Day Laborer Organizing Network, Sweatshop Watch, the Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights of Los Angeles, Clean Car Wash Campaign, the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund, and the Cannabis Regulations Commission, and the Police Permit Review Panel of the Los Angeles Police Commission. And that's just to name a few. So I'm very excited to have this moment, this opportunity to speak with you today. So how are you doing? Good, good. Thank you for that kind introduction. Appreciate it. Wonderful. And let's begin before talking about your book, about your history, your journey into social justice and labor issues. Well, I, I had to have a immigration story as many of us do, like I came to this country when I was four years old from Peru um, in 1967, and we ended up in New York City. And um, New York City was my childhood. And, um, you know, uh, New York City today is different than New York City in the 1960s and 70s. And you learn things quickly on the streets. Um, we had a lot of, it was a low income neighborhood, and we had a lot of migrant families from different countries. and. We try to coexist, but I also learned a, a lot about um, criminal justice on the streets. You know, back then there was a, you know, there was a lot of criminalization of young people by NYPD. Um, the public school system was in a chaotic state. State, and um, I wasn't learning anything. I, was, I, you know, really, I I learned everything, my values and principles from being on the streets with my friends and and how I embrace situations that came up. Um, but, you know, I, I learned, you know, how important work was, you know, the, uh, how important, um, you know, I learned about issues of poverty um, just from my experience. And I also learned about issues of justice just from seeing what, you know, what I went through, what my friends went through and, and living in a city that was really in um, struggling a lot with um, issues relating to, um, you know, the urban landscape. And um, today it's a different New York City but than it was back then. But I think that it helped create an evolution of me of creating a sense of justice, right? When I was a, um, a young, um, very young um, child. So I don't have any like, leader or family member who influenced me. I was influenced by just trying to figure things out on the streets of New York City. And I think that is still with me a sense of, but I felt like I, I had, there was something inside of me that created empathy. Like I, I will always look out for my friends and if I got a toy, I would pass, like if my parents got me a toy, I would play with it for a week and then give it to one of the kids in my street. Uh, I will always try to stick up for the that smaller kids are always bullied. Um, I would try to uh, also, you know, when we have pickup games, either stick ball or baseball or, you know, basketball games, I would sometimes have one of the kids who wasn't picked take my place, you know. So I, I always had that sense of empathy and justice instilled in me. And that, that's why I feel like what human beings were born with compassion. We're born with a sense of justice. It's just that, um, you know, how we tap into it, how we 
embrace it and bring it out. Because I think, I think you know, the human human beings were born to be in community. We're born to be in spaces where we uplift each other and help each other through compassion and empathy. Absolutely. And then what was your process? You went to undergrad and to law school, and then you ended up moving. I came here in 1992. Um, a year after I graduated from law school, I, went, I moved down to Virginia to go to undergrad and law school. And I came here because I I was really uh, inspired to come out here because of the Rodney King uprising in 1992. That city was in a major uprising. And I think that was a call for me to come here and help recreate a city where we are inclusive, where there's a sense of access, a sense of justice. Because as we know, it was more than just the LAPD beating of an individual. I think that the incident brought to the surface all of the issues of poverty, all of the issues of economic injustice, racial violence that was happening in Los Angeles. And so I thought there was a call for me to come out here and work with, in the recreation of a better city. And and then um, in the 1980s, I, when I was a student, I had done a lot of work with immigrant rights work. With uh, you know, Back then there was a the movement of sanctuary for um, the um, people fleeing the civil wars in El Salvador and in Guatemala. We were trying to fight the Reagan administration attempt to, uh, you know, support the military dictators in those countries. And then I also became part of the Sandinista youth movement, the youth brigade, to help the Sandinista government in Nicaragua. And they were fighting against the Reagan administration. Um, so it. I, you know, I had a sense of really connecting with immigrant rights work as my journey. And so when I came to Los Angeles, I started doing immigrant rights work right away. But then I started connecting uh, when I was in Maldives, I started con at the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund. We were doing that campaign, you know, that campaign against Prop 187, that initiative back in 1994 that was going to um, really criminalize undocumented immigrants in California. We were fighting in the, but I, I was also introduced to working with day laborers and they were trying to fight off the sheriff's deputies and LAPD from harassment. They were trying to ensure the survival of the street corners. And then I started connecting my journey between immigrant rights and labor. And then that connected me with the Chula, the Coalition for Human and Immigrant Rights in Los Angeles. And that, I think, working with Chula, then I, I transitioned to take over the Chula Workers' Rights Program. That was my connection with labor and immigrant rights because back then, and then I got to meet uh, labor leaders like Marilena Durazo. It's just, you know, she was trying to, you know, really grow that movement with hotel workers. I met Mike Garcia, who started a whole ja Justice for Janitors campaign. Um, so I, I, I then started connecting with unions and the labor movement and immigrant rights. and. Um, now there's a better coming together of those two sectors of immigrant rights and labor. But in the 1990s, they were still trying to figure out the coming together. And I felt like I was in the right moment at the right time. So your background, is is it focused in religion as well and spirituality? Were you raised religious? I, uh, I was not yeah. raised religious, but I had a... A spirit, I had, I mean, there was an intuitive side to me when I was growing up and... I would tap into that, you know, uh, that voice inside of me. I wasn't influenced. My, my, my family is only Catholic, but they were not practicing Catholics. I think of a Catholic school for my middle school years because my parents felt like I would be a better student. <laughs> like, uh, and so, but then I, I wasn't connecting with, I uh, mean, I started, uh, I did started going to church on my own. I did started to embrace the teachings of the gospel. Um, that's when I found St. Francis at that time. And he spoke to me more than the other saints because I felt like he was more genuine. Um, and so I picked things in pieces from my Catholic school years and I took that with me. But I, inside of me, I was trying to, it was always something I can, you know, uh, I was very imaginary when I was a child. But then looking back on it, I was probably not imaginary. I was connected with my inner self, my inner wisdom and for for guidance and for advice and and I took that with me into social justice work. I developed my own way of praying, my own way of meditation that connects with my Catholicism. I also explore my indigenous roots in Peru that comes from northern Peru and 
you know, I try to integrate my indigenous culture. Um, but I think what I was doing really was connecting with myself inside, I like go from the mind, putting that to the side and connecting with my other wisdom. So, cause I think we do have two wisdoms. One is what our brain, what we analyze, what we strategically think, our thought process. But the other is the uh, wisdom inside of us. And that, be, that could be a combination of different things depending on, on your life journey experience. But the important thing is I have the capacity to tap into it deeply and I become intuitive. So I pick things up in different spaces, um, emotions I pick up, like uh, struggling and suffering in, in a way that I'm able to give up that heart to heart connection deeply. Um, and not always analyze everything. So in the book, for the activist spirit toward a radical solidarity, and I read it very quickly. I read it in one sitting, actually. It's a beautiful book. And St. Francis of Assisi features prominently. And I felt a great synchronicity with this book because of my own personal journey. I was raised Catholic, have not been practicing for about 20 years, but it keeps coming back into my life in a lot of different ways. I grew up at a church called St. Francis de Sales in Western Michigan. So there was that. Went to Italy during the American invasion in Iraq and uh, went to Assisi and actually slept up on the uh, the hilltop and, and really had a, a very wonderful moment. And recently I've been doing some podcasts on faith and labor and uh, read Fratelli Tutti, which uh, Pope Francis really kind of discusses a lot of the work of St. Saint Francis. And I've been involved a little bit with the Catholic labor movement. And I've always been very interested in uh, liberation theology and uh, these questions of how religion isn't just this static thing or this internal thing, but it, it really is faith and good works. And you do an amazing job throughout this book, and we're going to be getting into it. But could you begin by talking a little bit about who was St. Francis? Yes, uh, St. Francis lived 800 years ago, and he was, uh, you know, the son of a wealthy merchant. And back then, capitalism was making its way into the the medieval economic system and the mercantile economy. I think it was the early vestiges of capitalism. And he um, he was uncomfortable being, you know, in that world of you know, being a wealthy son of a wealthy merchant, being privileged, uh, elitist. He signed up to be, for the army because back then cities were at war with each other and the papacy back then was a political institution. So there was a lot of wars between the cities and, you know, one of the signs of nobility was you become a knight and you can attack another city and you come back and you can talk about it and you become like this high stature, you know, and that was his dream. Um, but in the process of, you know, participating in a couple of wars against another city, other cities against battles, he he saw the other side, the suffering, the bloodshed, that inhumanity. And you know, Saint Francis was a soldier at night. To the, he probably participated in the the brutality against other other soldiers and other residents of other cities. So I think he witnessed the. The other side, they suffer away in the pain, and it caused uh, him to undergo a transformation. So that's the historical piece of it. But then you add in the the Catholic part of that history. You know, he started then really looking at the gospel of his sense of justice. You know, his sense of living out the teachings of the gospel because it embraces others. It, it helps, other, it comforts others through their suffering, provides services to others. Um, and that, that becomes like the Catholic perspective of St. Francis. But I think he was a, I think St. Francis today would have been a like, hardcore activist fighting against, you know, uh, economic inequality, fighting against racial violence, fighting, fighting against all the major issues that we're fighting against. He would have been at the front lines. He would have been on the picket lines. He would have been reading a lot of the campaigns. It, I think that's how he would, you know, 800 years ago, he was really, you know, he was a, um, a, a strong example of living the teachings of the gospel, but he was also a strong example of, a, of an activist fighting against injustice. You know? 
And you write a scene in the book. His father was a wealthy merchant, as you just said, and he eventually walked away from all the wealth and the trappings of the wealth and began focusing on the poor, the marginalized, and no longer being within the material world of concern and being on these higher level principles of humanity and love and helping each other out. And uh, that's, a, that's a really powerful. Yeah, and, and that's what story. we do is, you know, social justice is not a career path decision. We choose our life to do the work of social justice. And that can mean many ways. That can mean workers' rights, economic justice, criminal justice, immigrant rights, environmental justice. But we do we choose that as a life path, and we do sacrifice a lot because you know many of us in social justice work could probably make three or four times more money in the private sector because we're very gifted. We have a lot of skills, but we choose our life path. Um, if the work for justice is a life calling, and we choose that path to live our life doing the work for justice. And I think that's what you know. I think. That's why St. Francis speaks to us today. I think in many ways, like it's that calling and we we embrace that calling and we live up to it. We choose that path for our life. You only have one lifetime. And um, those are ways, that's why I really appreciate anyone who does the work of justice because you make a conscious decision of a life journey and you make that your path. You know? And you do note within the book, too, that you don't have to be religious. You don't have to be a Catholic or any type of denomination. Uh, this book can be for atheists, agnostics, anyone who uh, is interested in the tools that can help strengthen you in the process of being an, an activist, um, because it's, it's not easy. You're, you're dealing with very hard issues throughout the entire process of being an activist. And uh, the book is broken up in a format where you have short, very digestible chapters that are wonderfully reflective and you identify different types of um, prayers and, and thoughts. And then you go into the history of certain individuals who've really highlighted different aspects of uh, each chapter. And then you end with a poem and some space for reflection. So. Could you talk a little bit about the format of why you wanted to write the book like this? Yeah. So um, I wrote most of it during the pandemic. I wanted to make myself vulnerable and share with the entire universe that my reflection of go inwards and what speaks to me at that moment that I was writing those reflections. And the Peace Prayer of St. Francis is one of my... Um, mantras, mantras. And I re that's one of my, my prayer meditation every day. I actually involve the peace prayer of St. Francis. And I thought, well, if I take it and just take each verse of the peace prayer and go deep and what speaks to me at that moment and who comes to me in that space, whether it be the Dalai Lama or Desmond Tutu, then I'm putting them into the space. Um, that's my reflection at that critical moment. And a lot of it was done during the pandemic when we were all struggling. We were all struggling, not just with our private lives, losing family members, friends to that pandemic, but also in social justice work, people on the front lines, community leader, worker leaders, organizer, we were losing them. And we were dealing with so much loss and grief. And, and, and so the book, like each reflection in the book, if I were to take one Willis and reflect on it today, it would be completely different than it was at that moment I, in the book. But I went to this show that world out there, like, you know what, I'm willing to go deep and tap into uh, my inner wisdom, what's inside of me, that it, that part inside of me that speaks to me at that moment. And so when you talk about, like, um, we're in a struggle together, what does that mean? What does solidarity mean? Like, you know, we know what solidarity means as a strategy, right? You know, alliance building, coalition building, how the turnout for a protests on March, but what does that mean inside and what does, why is it that connects us and what is it that we can do to, uh, to be there more for each other in social justice work. And, um, I went deep on that because I think those are what, um, issues that people are feeling deeply during the pandemic. But I also, it's a reflection. So this book is not in any way to try to convince you, well, hey, come into St. Francis of Assisi's camp. 
because he's got the real deal, you know. <laughs> It's yeah. it's not that it's it's about like hey I'm going to make my put myself out there this is what speaks to me, but everybody has that you can do the same that's why I leave pages where you can write out your thoughts your reflections, uh, you know it's you know it's a meditative book that's why you know you go back and you can pick it up from any section you don't have to start from the beginning you can just pick it up from any verse it's the reflection that's space for you to write out your thoughts because I I'm inviting. I'm inviting other activists to go deep and, you know, we're good about the strategy and analysis and the planning, and, which is important. That's why we're great at dismantling injustice and doing campaigns. But sometimes we also need to connect with each other from the inside, like our inner selves, how we can, a heart to heart connection. And something I, I deal with constantly is seeing the totality of the problems in the world, seeing the fact that 10,000 children die every day of starvation or treatable diseases. Every single day, there's these children dying and there are things happening. Millions of children, just children are dying every year of things that we could fix right now with the technology we have. And when you really wrap your mind around that and you see just the greed and the corruption and even I, I would like to say the intentionally flippant nature of many people's view of the rest of humanity, which is a form of evil, I, it, it kind of overwhelms me. And sometimes it's, it, you get broken down and you can get pessimistic and cynical. And something that you really kind of start off with uh, one of the first chapters is about faith and the faith in the power of people and having a radical solidarity and having faith in each other in spite and in the face of these challenges and in, in this violence and these horrors to be able to find solidarity with each other and move us along the path of uh, what you cited as a revolutionizing the revolution. So when we take power, we are not just doing the same thing that was done before, but it is a change in consciousness for each other. And that, that was really powerful for me. Yeah. Cause you know, when you know, like, like being in our labor campaigns and immigrant rights campaigns, there's, there's so much that is beyond our control of the outcomes. And, but one thing we can always count on is each other. We can always count on that. And that's something that can never go wrong if we're, if we're able to connect with there for each other as activists, then whatever happens out there with our campaigns, you, know, you can have the best thought out strategies, the best campaign development plan, but something will happen out there that's beyond our control that we had no control over. But what we could control is, you know, at the end of the day, all we have is each other. And that also, if that's strengthened and that's meaningful connection, then no matter what happens, we accomplish a lot together. And another section, you look at justice and the fact that it is important to be outraged about injustice, but if you're just focusing on the negative all the time, it's going to eat you up inside. And so to really focus on the love for justice more than hating injustice. Uh, could you talk a little bit about- Yeah, you know, the experience? science- the science has shown that um, scientific study, neuroscience has shown that the human brain, like it's rapid, it's full of repetitive negative thoughts. So the average human being, we could have anywhere from 17,000 to 20 something thousand negative thoughts every day. You know, because it, we always think in terms of the negative scenario, because that's how we survive as a species. You know, that's that part of our brain, the amygdala that's always trains us to think negatively and a way to prepare for something. And uh, the problem is that that becomes a dominant thinking process and we don't ha ha harness that in a way that we also tap into the part of our brain that focuses more on the positive thoughts like compassion, the, the compassion, the emotion, the, you know, the empathy. Um, we, we're so dominated by negative thoughts and anger is, dominant emotion. Anger is that emotion that we all feel it, you know, because we know the injustices triggers the anger inside of us. And so I look to teachings like as Desmond Tutu and others on how to harness anger, because anger leads to hatred. 
and hatred that consumes you and it it's really not it, it can it can hurt you you know that that hatred and how to take anger and channel it in a positive force uh, because we do need anger we, we can use it as um, a way to energize ourselves but it's going to be what Desmond Tutu refers to as righteous anger so that it's channeled towards the injustice and not towards any particular individual that can lead to hatred and so that this was a challenge with the Trump administration because you know Donald Trump literally either through social media or one of his executive orders daily he was triggering anger inside of us and the, you know it consumed us so much that a lot of it led to then to hatred and then it it, it really heats us up inside we get so consumed by the hatred you know so Desmond Tutu will argue like channel it towards his executive orders or his actions dismantle those that's where you channel the anger and you're more effective in the work and it's a healthier way to channel the anger it's righteous anger so we do need anger but we need righteous anger not personal hatred anger and if you're constantly looking at an eye for an eye and you constantly have hatred for the other there's no way to have a reconciliation eventually yeah. to come to a point where you can find peace yes. and common ground there's and no so reconciliation with restorative justice and i think that's what Desmond Tutu taught us about the post-apartheid society in South Africa. Yeah, I, I really... It's difficult. Yeah, it's difficult. Yeah. So one thing I, I make sure my book is we're not, you know, we're not... The goal is not to be like a Dalai Lama, right? We're not Dalai Lamas. The goal is how to... We, we strive towards those ideals. You know, the striving is what we do, like striving towards righteous anger. We're not always going to get it. Like, I, sometimes I, I get angry and I, I hate and then I send an email when I shouldn't have sent the email or a text message. And then I go, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Then you start to feel your worse. That happens to all of us. In a way, human beings, we're fragile. We, we have our weaknesses. But it's the awareness. Create the awareness that we strive towards it. Knowing that we're not going to, like, there's no way I can ever be the Dalai Lama. <laughs> there's no way I can ever be a St. Francis of Assisi. I think that's why I refer to St. Francis as Francis. For, so for me, he was a human being trying to do the best he can in the service of others. Another part of it, too, is the deep breathing exercise that everyone needs to be equipped with the ability to do that personal meditation, the four second breath in and out to really kind of settle their emotions and not just constantly react. And I, I think there was one part in the book where you cited someone saying consciousness is between the stimulus and the reaction. And so that point right there in the middle where you take a step back and you actually yeah. decide to act. That was Victor is, Frankl. Yeah. And, you know, Victor Frankl survived Auschwitz. He was a Holocaust survivor. And he was a psychologist. He was in prison. That's the way he helped others live day by day. Because you didn't know whether the next day you would be called into the gas chamber or you would be burying the bodies of those coming out of the gas chamber. It was one or the other. And that was his way of trying to help uh, the other detainees, the other prisoners survive day by day in Auschwitz because you, 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 all, all you had was one day. You didn't know. And so he, that was his framework of how to help others survive the ordeal. The ones that didn't survive were the ones that were thinking too far ahead, you know, because you couldn't. It was a day by day situation whether or not you would be that, um, you would face death. And so he took that. Uh, after he survived Auschwitz, he became a peace activist and he took a lot of his teachings. And that's one of his strongest quotes that, you know, we were stimulated. We're always stimulated. So when you were stimulated, it could be anger, it could be other frustration, stress. And, and that response um, between the stimulus and the response, that's where we find our real freedom. And meditation, you know, breathing, meditation, those are ways to kind of stress that. You know, it's ways of how we create awareness a right perspective in that moment that emotions come in. Because, you know, we're very emotional, social justice work, and we sometimes not kind to each other. <laughs> and, you know, when campaign work, you're in, a, in mo spaces where other activists, emotion is very emotional, people get triggered. So in that space, bring in some practices that can ground you when you need it, and that makes the difference of how you respond with those situations. And 
Well, I, I really appreciate this book and every single chapter you present this balance where it's despair and hope and joy and love, darkness and light, uh, sadness and joy, the ego centered to the egoless and simplicity. Uh, try not to be understood, but to understand. Do not try to be loved, but to love. These are some age old wise teachings that I think we can all be more centered, more connected, and we're able to continue on with this struggle if we are able to embrace a lot of the lessons in this book. Yes, and you know, the one thing to clarify is really uh, this book is a, a, a reflection of my experiences and my life journey, but others can do the same because uh, there are so many powerful other reflections and teachings that are not in this book. It's a wide open area and people can bring in their different perspectives and, um, and, you know, it could be fun, either the religious or spiritual journeys or other teachings. And, you know, the idea is to create your own recipe. Like we all have the potential to create our own spiritual recipe. Of what, what we can tap inside of us, dive into ourselves and come out with that wisdom. And we all have the potential to do this, it's, you know, so it's not like this book is the one size fits all. Like, this book is my, I, uh, my, um, my uh, attempt to throw it out there and encourage others to do the same. And I think we'll be, um, with a much stronger movement when we tap into what's up here, but we also are able to tap it's what inside here together. But, and that's why I mean by radical solidarity. Well, we don't have too much time left, but I do want to talk a little bit about where you see labor is right now, where you see it's going, where we should be putting more of our effort into organizing uh, in the coming in the coming year and in the coming years. Well, you know, uh, the pandemic was that major crisis that's going to impact us for the rest of our lives because, you know, you don't, like, we didn't see a pandemic come <laughs> like two years ago. But it, it created an opportunity and opened it. Every crisis is an opportunity in every crisis. And I think today the labor movement has a golden opportunity when you, because the because pandemic brought out into the open issues of working conditions, economic injustice. People are now developing a better perspective of the quality of life. They don't want to go back to a job that was a dead end job, no benefits, no good wages. They want to organize for better working conditions. And unions are now seeing a more, more favorable uh, ratings. You know, the latest post shows, like especially young workers, um, the, you know, the Gen Z workers, and you know, that young know, workers are voicing labor movements as like a good model to look at to fight for better working conditions, better quality of life. And I think the labor movement has a, a golden opportunity that's never had before to flourish. But they need to then step up to it. They need to uh, transform and allow themselves to be transformed. Because, you know, my work at the Labor Center, I've always been about the transformation of labor movement. I think the immigrant rights, immigrant workers have transformed the labor movement that's more positive moving forward. But the labor movement now needs to be transformed to uh, connection with other social justice movements like, you know, criminal justice, environmental, the climate change issue, uh, housing. Um, I just think everybody sees uh, the union unions as something that's a, um, that they want to tap into to create a better working condition, better quality of life. And I think that it's a golden opportunity. And my hope is the leadership, the labor movement steps up, you know, we've seen it with Starbucks, REI, but all throughout the country, people are thinking unions, you know, like, I want to look into the possibility of collective action, unionization. So. I think the labor movement is never going to have the kind of opportunity that it has today. And now we need to work with the labor movement to step up and dive into this opportunity. And what could come out of this is the transformation of the working class and working conditions in this country that unions, the labor movement will be much stronger because we're, we're at, right now at 10.3% union density. Um, even in spite of all the organizing that's been happening the past couple of years, union density went down a notch again. 
Um, but we have a chance to, we have a chance now to change that. So the next year it starts going up union density. The more workers are unionized in this country, the more power the working class will have. And I'm optimistic. Like I'm optimistic about the, you know, the even like you got the you know, Obama never mentioned the World Union in his eight years of Biden's already mentioned it so many times, a loose count. So there's a lot of positive movement forward, but we need to fight for those. We need to change the labor laws. We do need a pro act. If it's not the pro act, what other legislation? But we do need to make it easier for workers to unionize because that's the question. Everybody wants to unionize, but there's still a lot of obstacles because the laws are so outdated. Well, I think one way to get prepared for organizing is to buy your wonderful book. And uh, Victor, thank you so much for your time and all that you're doing to fight for a better world. And you can buy your copy, The Activist Spirit Toward a Radical Solidarity from independent publisher, Hardball Press. And thank you so much. Yeah, and thank I you. I really enjoyed this opportunity to, uh, to sh have this conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. And this concludes Empathy Media Lab's Harmony of Interest book talks. And always remember, labor solidarity forever.